just a couple of questions uh, before I start, just to make sure I know uh, what everyone's current knowledge of Bitcoin is. Because um, I kind of feel like I've been uh, teleported from the future to come and tell people that there's this really important technology, this really you know, groundbreaking and un completely unbelievable thing going on. And, uh, and so you're just there thinking, oh yeah, you know, like Terminator, you're this guy who's just appeared in a plasma bubble and, uh, you know, in the nude and, and, you, and you're raving about, you know, robots from the future. Come to, it doesn't seem plausible, it doesn't seem real. So I've got to try and find a way to convince you what I'm talking about is, is for real. Uh, so uh, I, I, this is one of my favourite quotes to really describe what, we've, what we're seeing now in technology. It's sort of moving so fast, it's overtaking the pace of generations, over the pa overtaking the pace of pretty much anything else. Uh, William Gibson, of course, is a, a famous science fiction writer. Uh, but I, I, so I guess I, I want to see how well distributed the future is in this room. So who of you has ever sent or received an email? <laughs> Okay, so not everyone put their hand up there. Are you sure you heard me? <laughs> okay, good. So it's a, it's a high-tech crowd. Um, so who's heard of Bitcoin? All right, good. Uh, and uh, who owns Bitcoin? Okay, that's, that's, yeah, that's about three quarters. Um, who's ever been paid in Bitcoin? Yeah, there we go. Dwindling. Uh, and who has some skepticism about Bitcoin? All right, I advise everyone to have skepticism about Bitcoin. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I started out as quite a skeptic, but um, uh, I've been unable to find uh, enough strong arguments about uh, Bitcoin being, um, being a crazy uh, Ponzi scheme or anything, despite the repetition of such arguments. So a little bit about myself. I started, um, if we're talking decades, just roughly speaking, 30 years ago, playing with one of these little toys, which I would try and explain to people was the future and this whole computer thing was really a big deal and it wasn't just uh, for hobbyists, it was going to change the world. Uh, so I was pretty right about that. And then, <laughs> uh, about 20 years ago, uh, the, uh, the internet, and I would show people stuff like this and say, no, I know it doesn't look very uh, convincing, but this is going to be, this is going to change the world, this is the internet. And um, yeah, Yahoo is, is actually a company's name, and um, even though it's a crazy thing, it is, it is actually going to displace or disrupt, if you like, the, the latest term, uh, a lot of the, the current media, communications, uh, and um, publishing industries. Uh, and uh, I was right about that. Uh, then, about 10 years ago, I was really excited about a new development in a kind of software. This is a little bit more abstract than you know, the internet. Uh, but in some ways, it's very much the internet um, all, all over. There are these two ways to organize computer systems uh, that are very different to each other. One is uh, having a server, where it's, it's like uh, the king or the queen, the, 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 the central, central arbiter of all things that are happening, uh, the, the hub, and out on the edge, the, the people who are... Uh, who are benefiting or, or using that system. Early computer systems worked this way when they had multiple users and they had one big uh, resource. Uh, in, uh, yeah, around uh, the early 2000s, peer-to-peer -peer software came out. You might, have, you might have heard of Napster. It started to enable people to share files, uh, you know, all legal, of course, uh, but, you know, students in their dorm or whatever. And, of course, it was very quickly shut down. But what you may not know is that it was shut down because there was an element to it that worked like this. That's where you shut it down, right? You go here, you unplug that thing, and it's off. Uh, so Napster had uh, elements that worked like this, but it also had an element that worked like that. So the, uh, after Napster was shut down, they didn't repeat that mistake. The subsequent versions of file sharing software now, which account for one in every six bytes transmitted on the internet, that stuff is not capable of being shut down. And we know that because there are lots of people who are interested in spending a lot of money and legal effort and whatever else attempting and failing to shut it down over a decade. So uh, this is a significant technology. Um, and uh, what do we get if we put all those three together? The, the computer, the PC revolution, the internet, which is itself a distributed, sort of disorganized way of, of people all communicating with each other. And peer-to-peer -peer instead of server-based uh, uh, system architectures. We get Bitcoin. It is exactly that. There are some other elements to it. Um, so, for example, you might have heard that Bitcoin is digital money. So I haven't mentioned anything about money yet, 
And that's because really what's underneath Bitcoin is all that magic stuff I was talking about just then. But Bitcoin, right, uh, in the newspaper is uh, something financial, a way for people to transact money. Uh, it is a uh, separate currency or a unit of account, so it's not in dollars that I'm trans transacting with you, it's in this other currency. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very much digital money, but that is really missing the point. And if it was just digital money, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Uh, that would be really boring, digital money. It's just like normal money, but digital, right? And of course, when I'm talking about Bitcoin, there are many examples of this kind of digital money, which is peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, using that, op that architecture. Uh, and these, all of these are examples of what are called altcoins. And I'm just going to blur the lines in this talk. Sometimes when I say Bitcoin, I'm going to be talking about just Bitcoin and not these others. And sometimes what I'm saying applies equally well to many of these others. Okay? Uh, what they really uh, differ in terms of is, is normally technical and economic um, properties. Uh, but Bitcoin by far is the one you need to be paying attention to. It is the vast um, majority of uh, crypto, these are called cryptocurrencies as well. Uh, the vast majority of transactions and, and uh, value is held in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin really has been designed, the, the, the financial aspect of Bitcoin has been designed to be like digital gold. So gold, unlike, say, US dollars or Australian dollars, is said to have some value um, quite apart from what is uh, written on a piece of paper. Uh, its value floats, people desire it, uh, its value's been going up quite a lot recently, uh, and uh, its value it has a legacy which is very long. That's something that appeals to people, especially in uncertain times. Its, its total supply is fixed. We don't know exactly how much gold there is in the world or in the universe, uh, we have estimates, but we're pretty sure that you can't really make gold, uh, at least you can't make it uh, at the same uh, price that it's worth, so you can be burning money to do so. It's divisible, so it has some properties of a money that is good. Uh, Bitcoin is also divisible, uh, sorry I should say Bitcoin has a fixed total supply. 21 million Bitcoins, if you want to call them Bitcoins, although they're not actually coins. Uh, and Bitcoin and gold are both divisible uh, to a certain degree. Bitcoin more so, I'd say. Uh, currently, Bitcoin is divisible up to 100 millionth, uh, which is called a Satoshi. Uh, it's fungible, meaning all units are equivalent. Uh, really, it doesn't matter whether you've got this kilo of gold or that kilo of gold. It's worth a kilo of gold, assuming it really is gold. Uh, which comes to with another property, which is it's got to be recognisable. You have to not be hoodwinked into buying something, a brick which is full of tungsten core, which is in fact what New York gold dealers have recently discovered from drilling into their bricks. Um, it's, uh, it's also uh, politically neutral, um, a little asterisk, which means not really, of course. Um, politically neutral, meaning, well, um, uh, Bitcoin and gold both don't have, um, you know, the face of some uh, ruler on, on the front, typically. Um, they're just some, some uh, metal, some asset, some thing, which happens to have some properties that we, that we like. And that's where the value comes from. But Bitcoin has properties that gold doesn't have. Uh, it's got instant, instant international transmission of the internet, which has got some obvious value if you've ever used PayPal or anything like that. It's weightless, so you can carry around uh, your Bitcoin in your phone. Um, it's printable, uh, just like email is. Uh, you can have shared control. It's an interesting feature. You could, for example, uh, enable two different people to spend that same Bitcoin. Of course, you can't spend it twice, uh, but gold, you, you have to decide it's only going to be in one place. Only one person can actually exchange that gold. Um, leaving aside the whole paper gold market where you, go, you actually don't have gold, it's actually just a promise to have gold later. We'll just leave that out of the picture. Uh, it's backup friendly, you know, you can keep, make a copy of your data, you're making a copy of your emails so that if your house burns down, you've still got a copy somewhere else. Same with Bitcoin. Uh, it uh, also has some pretty cool things, like if, if I wanted to, I could make it possible that I can receive Bitcoin and confirm that I've received it, say, into my phone. But if, if I went downstairs and someone stole my phone, I can make it so that you, I, my phone isn't capable of spending that. It's only capable of confirming receipt. Okay, so if you imagine sending some kid to the market to sell the cow, he can't, he can't be rolled on the way home to, to, to exchange for some magic beans or anything. 
Uh, it's, it's, here's, an, here's an interesting one. It's memorizable. Now, uh, this is probably a bit mind-blowing, but you can actually, just like you can print your Bitcoin, there is a way for you to, to uh, just remember your Bitcoin, in which case it has no, no uh, bytes on a computer or a device and no printed page just in your head. You can travel across, across borders and they can scan you all they like and they can't see that you, that you know your Bitcoins. And those Bitcoins can be worth any financial amount. So you might have heard this about Bitcoin, it's doing that, which is sort of maybe sometimes is true. Um, this is why investors get excited about Bitcoin. Uh, you might have also heard that it, it's like this, which is why everyone gets, well, some other people get excited about it. Um, but really what Bitcoin is, is the most exciting uh, and revolutionary development in computer science uh, in, in the last 20 years. And that's not a financial thing. There's something that someone like me as a sort of uh, technologist or a, or a geek really is interested in. It's not a product. It's, there's no company that controls it. Um, it's, uh, it's totally decentralized. Okay? That's a fundamental and defining feature of Bitcoin. Uh, it's independent of banks, independent of governments. So these are the sorts of things you need to remember. That, and this is why I say Bitcoin's neutral. Everything's black and white, one and zero. It's either, it either follows the rules of Bitcoin, it is uh, audited uh, by software, uh, or, it, or it's not. It's, it's uh, like maths. It doesn't depend on who you are. You know? It's not that uh, you know, 6 times 7 is 42, except for you. you know? And that can certainly be the case with, uh, with, with fiat currency or with, with any other kind of financial instruments that are uh, controlled or, or um, influenced by uh, centres of power. So that's why I say that it's apolitical or it's not political, but it's political in another way in that it's, it has a certain radical neutrality. You know? That's a sort of political position, if you like. So it's semantics, but, it's, but that's why I can, you can see Bitcoin as being political because it doesn't care. But you can see it as being unpolitical because it doesn't care. But it's, it, it's, it's fully decentralized. That is the most important defining feature of it that you need to be uh, aware of. Because we're going to see, as Bitcoin gathers traction in the societies, in the, in the markets, we're going to see lookalikes put out by the banks and the companies, and they're not going to be fully decentralized. If they were fully decentralized, they would be Bitcoin, or there would be a poor imitation of Bitcoin. Um, and why is it important that it's fully decentralized? because it doesn't have a single point of failure. And if anyone has ever seen, like I don't want to wreck this movie for you, but if, if anyone has ever seen Star Wars, you'll know it's a very sore lesson that Darth Vader learned, that if you have a single point of failure, this is what will happen to you. Uh, so, on the 22nd of November last year, somebody, and as far as I know, nobody knows who, uh, transferred $147 million US instantly, and have a guess how much they paid for that transaction. Nothing. Exactly. And you tell a room full of bankers, I'm not sure if I'm speaking to a room full of bankers, but uh, you tell bankers that, and they just they get a little uncomfortable, <laughs> right? Because that's not their fee that they've charged for doing that sort of thing. So how did that happen? Well, this guy, this whoever it is, because nobody knows, Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper, this was 2008, explaining a system for peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. And this is, this is a document you can go and read, and I do encourage you to do that, because it's, only, it's barely nine pages long. It describes fully how it works and why it should be made, or why it is, has been made. Where is that document? Uh, it's actually all over the place, um, but if you Google for it, you'll, you'll probably find it under like bitcoin.org slash uh, bitcoin.pdf even. But it's called the Satoshi White Paper. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a piece of the software code. Now, I'm not expecting everyone or anyone actually to understand what this means, but what I want you to know is that if you can read computer code, this is, this is a particular kind of computer code, just as someone who can read Spanish or English can understand what that means, you can see exactly how Bitcoin works. So you don't need to trust me or anyone else that Bitcoin does work or that it does what I say it does. You can go and see if it does. And people do. And the most important thing about this is that 
it's completely open kimono. There's no, there's no trade secrets here. There's no, uh, you know, oh, you know, this is, well, just trust us. This is this, you know, trust us technology people to say that this really does, you know, save the world or whatever we're saying. There's none of that. Um, you can hire your own person who can read this to determine for you whether it works, okay? You do not need to trust anyone, uh, you know, who, who has an interest in this to tell you the truth about what, it's all, what it all is. So why did he do it? Why did Satoshi Nakamoto make um, this, this decentralized cash? Was he just annoyed with, with PayPal? Uh, well, this happens to be, I tried to make this as technical and, and uh, you know, as sort of uh, hostile as possible to, uh, to a non-technical audience. So I hope you like the curved, the curved screen there. This is the very first block on the blockchain. The blockchain, if you've ever heard of it, is basically where all the Bitcoin is. It is the ledger that the unit of account that the, all of the transactions are written into. The very first one contains a message in English which comes from the headline of the Times. Uh, it says here, and, and this for, uh, has a couple of purposes. Uh, one first and important thing, if you've ever seen people hold a newspaper up uh, when they take a photo to prove the date, it, it proves that the block was created uh, no earlier than the date of the newspaper, because how else would they know what the headline was going to be, whoever they are? Uh, it also has this headline, Chancellor on the Brink of Second Bailout for Banks. Now, I don't think that headline's an accident being in the blockchain, given that this is a decentralised currency. Uh, that's just a hunch. Maybe he's got uh, a bone to pick with the current financial system. So there's a little bit of polit politics creeping in, but again, it is that radical neutrality uh, kind of politics. You might also have heard that this Satoshi Nakamoto was identified or found by a Newsweek article. Well, not according to this guy, who ha whose name happens to be Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto, but honestly, nobody knows. Uh, one thing to, important thing to know about Bitcoin is that it's only five years old. Uh, and and uh, for most of the first year, it really had no value. It was just being played with. Um, and and the stage we're at now in Bitcoin is that you really have to roll your sleeves up and get dirty with it because it is not all mapped out and easy. It's kind of hostile. It's a little bit like the internet was in, you know, 94. That's a constant refrain. It's a little bit like the PC was in 84. You know, kind of hard to use. Uh, and, uh, and so, but that's going to change. And I actually think it will change a lot faster than the internet did. So here's an example of something, really a burning important issue that can be addressed with Bitcoin today. Uh, remittance, which is sending money overseas. Uh, Uganda uh, has a remittance industry of about $700 million worth uh, transmitted every year uh, for a fee of between 10 and 20%. That's sort of the average. Um, bank fees are, you know, just like your email costs, you know, wh whatever it is, like 40 bucks or something to send, right? Um, no, your email is basically free because it's so cheap, it's not worth metering. And so should um, sending money be. Uh, bank fees uh, in Uganda are more expensive than a mobile phone. Uh, and globally, that, uh, that market is um, more than 500 billion with a 9% average fee. But of course, the fees vary uh, and um, the, the highest fees are for the places that tend to need the money the most. So even if you just reclaimed that percentage, that's a huge potential for sending money to, to, to exactly these sorts of people, like, like this guy. Uh, I think his name's Ronald. Um, he's a student in Uganda, and he's, um, yeah, up to 40% these these fees. Uh, he's, he's been sent money. Um, there's an interesting film about uh, how this, uh, uh, the story of this, uh, this guy Ronald's uh, sister marrying a... Um, a man and moving to America and then trying to send him money through MoneyGram and, and Western Union and, and paying a lot of money for it. And so they've, uh, they've investigated and, and in some cases succeeded in sending in Bitcoin as a, as a much cheaper alternative. Um, also, I want to give you a, a sense of some of the other stuff that, uh, that's happening in the world outside of just a better payment system for shoppers. Uh, this is um, uh, Bitcoin Lady, her, her uh, Twitter handle is. Um, she's from Botswana, uh, and actually in, in um, trying to research the, uh, the sort of tragic illness her, her son, um, uh, Paco Jr. had, she uh, was looking for ways to make money, looking for a way to 
to, to find um, answers and, and to collect funds and to earn money online, uh, and she found Bitcoin. And what she's undertaken is a, is a mission to spread Bitcoin through, uh, through Botswana. Uh, this, is, this is her words. This is, this is her own way of saying <clears throat> why you should care about Bitcoin, what it could be good for. Uh, I have my words. She has her words. There's nobody in charge of Bitcoin. She can, she can say what she wants about it. She can tell uh, her uh, community about how they could use it. And, uh, and she does. So, so in Bitcoin, there's a certain amount of freedom uh, emphasized. You, don't, you, you take a third party out of the transaction. There's nobody there to stop you from sending money to somebody else or to charge you for it. Uh, so is that politics? Uh, there is politics in it. Uh, there are a lot of libertarians who love it uh, because of the freedom aspect. Um, and it's kind of blind, and I sort of thought maybe that's a little bit like the law is supposed to be. But, but one thing's for sure, nobody writes folk songs about PayPal or MasterCard, okay? But they do, there's a real community in Bitcoin. They, they do write folk songs about Bitcoin. Um, this is a, I think this is a significant distinction. Uh, it is something that's from the, from, from the grassroots, really. So what do people think about it? Well, Bill Gates has got some good things to say about it. A lot of people say, wow, this technology is amazing. You know, I kind of feel like it's probably not going to work. It seems too outlandish, but the technology looks great. Uh, other people, uh, for example, um, Nobel Prize winners in economics, uh, have some uh, nasty things to say about it. They don't, uh, don't like it. Um, novelists also don't like it. Uh, yeah, actors don't like it. So there's plenty of people who don't like it, uh, which is, I think, perhaps an interesting feature of it. It gets people riled up. But what we're really seeing is a, is a transformation, a technology-driven transformation from a hierarchical, centralised control system where you've got national borders, you have third-party risk in transactions, every time you perform a credit card transaction, the fee is mostly going to fraud prevention or fraud uh, remediation, uh, mostly because there is such a huge amount of fraud in there. Uh, we have concepts of authority, you've got this organised, who's in charge here? You know, like this person says, no, this is the way it goes, and they have to, uh, they have to mediate everything. Uh, regulation, uh, we have to prevent people from doing the wrong thing, uh, and it's all really a system of barriers. And the transformation I'm describing here is from that to a system of zero trust. What I, what, what really, I, it's not actually zero trust, uh, it is not entrusting a third party to, to ensure that the thing happens, the transaction happens as it should. And these transactions don't have to just be simple payments. It's very much broad, and I'll get into that. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a question of consensus, so very much like, vo like voting. The, the, the mechanisms inside Bitcoin, which I won't go too much into, ensure that, uh, that there is agreement about what the state of the Bitcoin network is. Because if, if you're doing peer-to-peer, -peer, if there's no central person in control, you're going to have to find a way for people to all have the same view of what's going on, of where the money is, of what transactions happened. That's what consensus means. It's low friction. It's eliminating categories of risk. If you don't have that third party in there in the, in the credit card transaction, that bank doesn't have to have systems in place to ensure that their own employees don't rip you off. They don't have to have insurance and whole industries of auditing. They don't have to have any of that. So it's a certain category of, of risk has been eliminated. So it also represents choice. It's an open market, a currency alternative. So we're accustomed to government monopolies and financial institutions being the ones who define things like money. And I was accustomed to that. I didn't think that someone could write a software program and create money. That seems completely ridiculous. But uh, I've become convinced that that's entirely possible. And the reason it is is because of this, this basic technology and that transformation from those authority systems to an alternative which is centralised, sorry, decentralised consensus networks. We're going to see these things all over and what they can do is not just replace PayPal or credit cards or banks or anything. They, what they can do is well beyond what we can imagine right now. But I can give you some examples. These things are most certainly possible. So provably fair voting. 
uh, creating laws and regulations, even creating jurisdictions where you can seek to, see your, to, to get rulings. Now, whether they're enforceable is a separate question. I guess it depends on who's got the guns. Uh, corporate governance, you know, uh, are things being done right? Uh, notarization, just simple things like, did this happen? Is that that person? Um, identity and name registries. Uh, this is something I've been working on recently. Betting uh, and gaming um, on, on outcomes, uh, like the stock market, say. Uh, open book accounting. So if you're, if you're running a charity and you want to show that uh, no one's cooking the books and every, all the money's going to where it's supposed to go, you can just open your entire transaction ledger at no, no cost. You don't have to do any work. You just say, it's all there. Have a look. And everyone can see where all the money's going. So you don't have to be trusted. So you're removing yourself from, from, being, from needing to be trusted. Uh, and that's an efficiency that occurs in any system where you remove a party who has, who has to act correctly for everything to work. Uh, proof of existence, like the patent system. I thought of this idea first. I've, I can prove it. I've got the document. How do I know that that was really published at that point in time? Bitcoin enables today, enables you to do that for, for really no cost. Trust funds, you can set up things where there's time delays and there's all sorts of um, you know, limited access and shared access. Stock certificates, finan other weird financial instruments that we haven't heard of or that I don't know about. Prediction markets. Um, which are actually really interesting. If you want to talk to me about them or ask about them or if you know anything about them, then, um, yeah, I can, we can go into that. Auditing, this is a really big one and a really boring one, but I think it's a really big one. Uh, and, and any kind of licensing. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff there and that's not the full list. Uh, so, so what we're seeing is, and this is Al Gore's words, you know, we're talking about the replacing the functions of government. I mean, that's from his point of view. It's not just the functions of government, it's any functions that have that same shape. He's a big fan. So what I really hope anyone who's uh, heard this, uh, who is interested in Bitcoin, maybe who hasn't got any Bitcoin does, is install a wallet, a Bitcoin wallet, on your phone or on your computer. Uh, you, just, you can play with a couple of dollars worth. Uh, you can accept Bitcoin for your services or your, uh, you can sell your secondhand surfboard for Bitcoin. Um, and you can also buy Bitcoin at exchanges or ATMs. There are a couple of ATMs in Sydney now that uh, will sell you Bitcoin for, for cash. You insert the notes and then uh, you, you hold your phone up to the little window and it sends Bitcoin into your phone. You can also spend it, of course, but, um, but there's really no barrier. You don't need an account with anyone. You don't need to go and ask permission. You just install a free app and get Bitcoin from someone who's got it. And uh, I just want to leave you with a quote because often these things are quite challenging to us. And this is from uh, Douglas Adams, uh, another science fiction writer. Anything that is in the world when you're born is normal <laughs> and ordinary, and just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting, revolutionary, you can probably get a career in it. Anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. So Bitcoin was invented about when I was 35 or when I was after the uh, where I was older than 35, but, um, but I think it's pretty cool. I think I can get a career in it. <laughs> Thanks very much for your time. Any questions for Chris? Chris. Um, my name's Alex, thank you. Um, that was really interesting, and I'm sort of just getting up to speed with Bitcoin, but it seems to me to say you you don't have to be entrusted or put your trust in a sort of central, you know, government-like figure, but you, I suppose, have to put your trust in the system, that it, that it works and that the code works and that it can't be corrupted or overridden or anything like that. Um, yes and no. Like, uh, if you're not uh, a developer or, you know, a programmer who has um, analysed to their satisfaction every line of code, then yes, you're putting your trust in someone. But what you're not putting your trust in is someone who you can't then follow up on or do counter checks on. And you're not putting your trust in a person who, who is, whose motives may actually be counter to yours. You're not actually entrusting anyone to hold something that's, that's of value to you and decide not to rip you off. You know? you're, you're actually banking on other people acting in their own self-interest. Uh, that gets a little bit into how Bitcoin transactions actually work and how Bitcoins are generated, but it, it's, it's based on, a, on an aligned set of interests. So you're not, you're not relying on 
uh, on people doing the right thing. You're relying on people doing what's good for themselves, mm. and that tends to be a lot more reliable. <laughs> Two questions, if that's okay. Uh, first one is, okay, you've got a lot of people taking it on board, a lot of people trying to get people to buy the Bitcoin to transact with, which of course is the main focus of what it's good for. But you're going to get, a, I think, a lot of demand very quickly with the currency available slowing down. So what does that do to the price mechanism? involved with that type of construct? Well, if I remember my high school economics, I think when the demand increases and the supply stays the same, the price goes up. However, that's the, price, the price goes up when outside of the, tra of the currency you're using, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about pricing a good or a service. Right. Volatility? Yeah. So if you... So, um, yeah, this is a this is a problem. Um, I guess it's I, not I a problem. I don't think it's a problem. I'm just thinking well, if, something. Good. If you're holding Bitcoin and the volatility is always upwards, it's not a problem, right? But um, if you price goods in Bitcoin and you label the the price in Bitcoin and the, and the, the value of Bitcoin relative to the to the uh, expense to supply the goods, which is actually denominated in say dollars, which is the case with the many vendors today who accept Bitcoin, they're paying dollars and they're selling for Bitcoin, right. then that's the problem. And that problem exists in any currency pair or any good pair. If the, if the, if the cotton crops are all destroyed and the actual um, supply of cotton is, goes down, the relative value of cotton goes up and T-shirts cost more and everyone needs to sort of figure that out. So we have that in everything already. What we don't have is the scale of volatility that Bitcoin has. And so that's really the problem you're describing. And it is a problem. However, there are vendors who will take, for a merchant, that will take that away. Because you can denominate your goods in dollars. And, and in fact, you could have a transaction where nobody knows they're using Bitcoin. They're, they think they're using dollars. You know, if you use a wallet, you can actually see your balance in dollars. You can be quoted a price for beer in dollars. You can you know, squirt your smartphone at the QR code, which is how it tends to work these days. You can do that and see dollars change. Uh, but of course, you will see your dollar balance go up and down because it's actually showing you dollars based on the current price. And if the price against dollars of Bitcoin on the markets changes, then you're going to see some uh, volatility, it's called. But if you... Uh, so it is a problem. But... Sorry, did I answer that? Well, with the, yeah, that's a... I'm just curious. It's going your, down over time, though. I'm, I'm curious in your, your take on it, because I've got mine, and I'm curious. Anyway, the other question is, with that mouth box, um, you know, with all the yeah. currency disappearing, does that mean it's going to be, you know, when it reaches the end of line, 21 million, is it 21 million minus the stuff that gets lost along the way, or does it reappear? Depends. Or? If it's destroyed, then yeah. It's just as if gold was annihilated in a nuclear explosion or something. Right. That gold is gone forever and the total gold supply in the world is reduced. And everyone expects that because the, it's known that there are bitcoins that have been lost, if you lose your keys, there's no way that anyone knows to recover them. Right. Uh, so the total supply of bitcoin, in fact, will degrade. Right. Uh, it's also worth noting that no one knows... Uh, no one knows how much is lost or gone, and it's impossible to find out unless someone says, "I lost prove that I've actually lost lost this because blah 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 blah." Because I, I threw out my old computer in yeah. the dump and in the dump, the, which is yeah. but, a number of but times. But then, when you get to twenty one forty, you know, hypothetically, if we get to around forty, just kidding. So, <laughs> <laughs> the, then, because the 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 limit is twenty one million, but you've got this loss along the way. Yeah. It, that means that when that last coin is reached, you know, how do you know the difference when the, when the system knows that technically I made 21 million coins, but hell if I know what you guys did with it, so have a nice flight. Yeah. Um, do you know the, what I mean? Sort of. So, so the, the total supply isn't really that important. It's just a number. Um, dividing that number up is really where, it, where the um, sort of allocation comes from and we can continue to divide that so it doesn't really matter how much there is in in total bitcoins because these aren't coins remember this is just a just a unit uh, but the the 21 is not written in the source code it's an emergent value that comes from the fact that they award 50 bitcoins every block and every block is well this was in the in the first roughly oh, four I years see. and that so so every 10 minutes a block is, uh, this is the mining, I don't need to go into detail, but it's an emergent property of the way that Bitcoin is allocated uh, oh. over time and that, such that it will reach 21 million. 
It wasn't that 21 million was such a great number. It's just that 50 seemed like a good number and 10 minutes seemed like a good number, I suppose. We and don't so really the, know. The, the, uh, the difficulty gets to the point where it's like a log. You get to the end and that's 100%, it. 100%, yeah. Yeah, so... Right, thanks. I have a little I've got to have this say if I've got to sell my hampers in Bitcoins. So I sold a hamper today and then the price of Bitcoins went up and... I could actually make money selling my hampers at this price, but actually the price has gone up. And then if I cash my money, I'm actually making money. Uh, yes, so you can decide ahead of time if you want to do that, but you have that problem if you sell them for US dollars and your expenses are in Aussie dollars today. The, the, this is similar to the question I was answering before. You have the exact same problem now, but with Bitcoin, the volatility is much greater. And so what you might like to do is talk to Jason uh, or anyone else who provides a solution to that because you can, for a small fee, a small percentage fee on the transaction, you can take the volatility out. But at the moment, the price is going up, so... Well, it's going up and down. Like, it's been kind of, yeah. The, 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 the analogy of the roller coaster is, is really true. It can, it can go up and down, and you can flash crash, and, you can flash, and people can buy in really, really quickly and affect the market. It's, so it you is, take that. You're, you're taking the risk. Yes, <laughs> it's not meant to be an advertisement, but, uh, but payment no. processes generally, yeah. generally do that. That's what they do. So. Well, this, this is an essential service for someone who's selling stuff. It enables you to denominate your hampers in dollars and receive 100% of that in dollars into your account. And that you know that you will receive that. Uh, and it's, it's really the same deal as, as the credit card company gives you, but it's actually in practice in a lot of these companies. And it isn't an ad for Jason, but you know, like I know his numbers and I know the, the American yeah, equivalent. I'm his from yeah, it's like a 1%. 1%. Yeah. Less than what I'm yeah, you're probably paying 3% to, for credit cards, yeah. Uh, Chris, yeah. Uh, I'm definitely a Bitcoin and not a new voter to a guy, so I'm still waiting for someone to plant that seed in my head that says I've got it. Yeah. Here, I... I'll let you know if it ever happens to me. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, that's comforting. But just right now I've heard that it's actually technology, it's not a digital currency, so... You know, back, I'm an ICT guy, um, back in the before your vintage as well. But um, do you have something that encapsulates what it is or what it is not so that this object does it? Yeah. It's and digital, it. it's digital it's scarcity. Else. Bitcoin is digital scarcity. Okay? So what we're used to is... Okay, so do you, I can be more concrete about it. So what you're used to in the digital realm is just infinite reproduction of everything. You know, like you can duplicate movies and emails and everything, and you're used to that with digital. It seems like it's a defining feature of digital stuff. But what, what this is is a limited an, a amount of, of digital stuff. And the limits and, what, and, and how the, the actual mechanisms to establish those limits are like contracts. Those are cryptographically secure contracts. If you, if you understand cryptography, it's all based on digital signatures. So uh, a check, right? I sign a check, and that's a promise, or a, and that is a, um, the authorization to remove some funds from my balance in the bank, right? You could base a check on another check. You have a, you know, I, I don't know whether I've got funds in the bank, but I've got a check, which allows me to take funds out of the bank. And you could have a long string of checks. And that is exactly what Bitcoin is, a long string of checks with digital signatures on them where they go back to when the Bitcoins were created. In each case, that's called mining. Thanks, Chris. Sorry, if you don't mind, we might um, hear from Claire. Chris will be around and other Definitely. around and have a quick chat afterwards, but if we just move on to Claire's presentation. Um, can you join me again once again? Thank you, Chris. Sorry, one more thing. I have, I have recorded.